Okay. Let's see. Terrible glare. Is that any better? Nope, that's worse. Is that better? I'm trying to find the right level. Hi, Chuck. Um, all right, I'm just going to get the axing done real quick. So this is an eating spoon for a Finnish company. There's this, uh, there's this woman who got in touch with me. She said she really liked the spoon I'd carved that she saw a picture of. And she said if I could... She, she was looking for a thousand wooden spoons. <laughs> When I got in touch and asked her what the heck was going on, she said it was a um, she said it was a Finnish yogurt company looking to source a, a sort of groovy wooden spoon that could be marketed to hipsters as a plastic alternative. And I said, "Well, I can't possibly make a thousand for you, but I am super intrigued about." working with you because she said that she was a um she said that her specialty was sourcing things for people um so she said there's some other project that they want to see if they can get me involved with uh essentially creating a sort of online curated thing of makers whose work they like <clears throat> So I'm not going to be making a thousand eaters, although boy, that would be, that'd be pretty funny. Um, but I am making them an eater right now to demonstrate that I know what I'm doing. So <clears throat> I can barely see comments, but as soon as I'm done with this blank in just a few minutes, I will sit down somewhere where I can actually see your comments. I thought I was going to be out here, and I might be, but if the glare's too bad to see what you guys are doing or saying, I might pack things up and go inside. Anyone have any questions? see that I'm using this as a place to jam the end of the spoon under, except I need to relocate it so that I can get to the, where I need to do the stop button. <laughs> um, because this hoop house is so warm, I'm careful to uh, avoid storing lots of wood in it, so like when I split open a log, Anything I'm not going to use within a couple days, I'm careful to store outside of the hoop house so that it doesn't dry out too fast. I have maybe a couple small pieces and one large piece in here that are going to become spoons tomorrow. But other than that, it's all small. Another thing I've started to do is gather up all the bigger chunks. And I have a whole stack of milk crates right over here. Now that I have a wood stove that I can burn stuff in, it behooves me to just collect it all, store it in the store it in the milk crates, and then I will have it. Okay. Hi Graham. Hi Rachel. Hi everybody else whose name I don't know. Just carving a simple eater today. I said, so I'll repeat the story. This is an eater for a woman who reached out from Finland who asked if I had the ability or interest in making her a thousand spoons. <laughs> Uh, I guess she's a she's a sourcing specialist and had been hired by a Finnish yogurt company 
to find someone who could get her a thousand spoons that they would give away as part of a maybe sell as part of a campaign to hipsters. Um, and I told her I couldn't make a thousand spoons for her, but uh, but that if she ever had wanted something more like fifty spoons that I would be delighted to work with her. So she got back and said that she does stuff all the time with smaller numbers and seemed like it would be a good relationship to have in the future. So I'm excited about that. She asked if she could buy an example of my work to see firsthand. So I'm doing that right now. And she asked specifically to see the eater that got her to reach out in the first place. So, okay, almost done with the axing, and then I'll move somewhere where I can see everyone's comments a little bit. That's a lot of spoons, a lot of hipsters. Yeah, well, that's the thing, Dan, right? It's like, cities are full of hipsters. We just aren't aware of it living where, as we are out in the country. And I think what we do could definitely be made to appeal to the culture at large. You know, certainly in the U.S., let alone in the world, right? Um, so, yeah, it, it doesn't seem out of the question. And it also is kind of like, I don't know, totally fascinating to think about that kind of scale. Not, like I said, that I have any uh, availability to make a thousand spoons, but even so. All right, let's see here. Mm, can I move? Stand by. Take move the bench. Uh, yeah, New York City alone has a few million hipsters. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Um, that was, uh, it's kind of sort of dry wood. It's, it's stuff that's been sitting in a log for, mm, let's see, the tree came down sometime this fall. And, um, good. That's good. I can read what you guys are saying. You guys can see me. Yeah, it's not too much clear. Whew, it's hot in here. Um, so, let's see. I guess I'll give the old knife a strop before I start, just to make sure my finish is as impressive as it can be. Um, all right, this is that long strop that Tom Scandian very kindly made for me. Bear with me with my technique. This is literally the third time I've used it. But I was excited about this idea from seeing Daniel Lundgren's store sloyd using a strop like this. And I commissioned Tom to make me one. Tom wants all of you to know, and I also agree, that his standard strops are still excellent. This is not to say that this is like something you should get instead of his other straps. It's just me experimenting. And because I have his other straps, I know what those are like. But this is the idea is that this is long. And I've always engaged more with holding tools, sharpening systems in the hand rather than putting them on a bench. Thanks, Graham. And uh so I like this. In in the virtual apprenticeship challenge that I'm running right now, there's actually this really interesting like tool invention that's going on, spurred on by this, where people are trying to create extensions for the straps they already have and figure out how to get them to pivot with the tool more easily. And I think it's super interesting when people feel empowered to uh, try new things. So. One other thing I want to show here is the cross-hatching of compound on this strop in the suede side. Uh, that cross-hatching was something that Tim Manny showed us at Greenwood Fest. And 
I think it's a great way to evenly spread the compound on the leather without just scrubbing the whole thing because the, there doesn't need to be a lot of compound and this way it gets evenly distributed. So that actually has compound. And then this is the uh, flat leather side, the smooth leather side. So it's all it's an all-in-one tool, which I like a lot also. Um, So for me, this just more closely matches motions that I'm already comfortable with. And I like that I can apply lots of pressure with the knife hand. And I can really see the edge and make sure that I'm truly getting the proper edge contact and tip contact. But again, you're seeing me doing this. This is only my third time ever using this kind of strop. So I don't really know what I'm doing yet. Um, and then Tom very cleverly punched a little hole here and that matches with this hole here. So I always put it back in the case with the suede side on the same side every time so that the, the compound doesn't get all over the place. So, all right, neater. Um, um, how many people who are watching have seen me carve before? It would be helpful to have me narrate what I'm doing or, or not. I don't want to bore anybody who's heard me say all this stuff before, but I'm seeing a lot of names that I don't recognize, although I'm also seeing a lot that I do recognize. And uh, I'd be very happy to sort of describe what I'm doing and why, but I certainly don't have to. We could talk about... Uh, talk about the Spoonosaurus magazine issue that I'm formatting right now. I'm actually taking a break from finishing that formatting to come carve this while I still have daylight. And uh, or we could talk about the upcoming Western Mass Spoon Club gathering. It's happening at Dwight Beebe's shop next Saturday. Excited about that. Or we could talk about the Spoonosaurus gathering that Matt and I are going to be hosting in March. You would love some narration. Okay, so who was it that? Jake Harmon. Great, Jake. I'll narrate for you. So I find when I'm, I get the axe sort of pretty rough, it's, it's rough, right? It's not right to the line. And then with the knife, I very quickly and roughly go around that drawing that I drew just at right angles, as though I were taking it to a bandsaw. If I had a bandsaw, who knows? I might just take it to the bandsaw. All I'm trying to do is get close to that drawing that I drew, but the drawing I drew is is itself rough. There's I'm not at all attempting to draw the shape that's the final shape. I'm trying to draw a sort of rough version that gives me wiggle room and the ability to adjust if I discover something after the fact. So you can see I'm not trying to get my neck transition smooth or anything like that. All I'm trying to do is get the outline close to what I wanted the outline to be. I also knock off these corners because it's less painful on my chest. Although in the winter time when you're wearing sweaters, it's less of an issue. So, um, all right, so once you get the outline, then I want to carve the top face first before I do anything on the bottom face. And the reason I carve the top fa face first is because there are ax marks here on the top face where I came in from either side and I need to make sure I eliminate those. And I want to do that before I do anything back here because I might need to go deeper than I think in order to eliminate them, you never know. So, for eaters I tend to start at the tip of the handle because my eater these days has a tail flip. I, um, I start shallow and immediately go deep and then kind of shallow out again and that creates the tail flip. Now, you can see there's a certain amount of grain tear out right here and that's telling me that um, because of the flow of grain, actually you can see it really well here, because this isn't tilted very far within the grain, I don't know if you can actually see that grain, that I can't go up again too high in this instance. So uh, I can do a couple things that will help me with that. One is I push the whole handle deeper so that instead of the handle sort of being true to this, the handle is actually going to be 
a little bit more angled down like that, if that makes sense, which is why it's important to leave some extra material back here so that I can make that adjustment without it being a crisis. But essentially, by, by going deeper with that tail flip down into this material that's here, it allows me to uh, not go as uphill in the grain here, and so I can deal with the fact that it doesn't, that it wants to start to tear out. What about there? Okay, so that is the top of my handle um, for now. And again, I'll adjust it later. Um, but I've tilted it enough, and now I'm going to do a little push down in here just to establish that cut that goes all the way across both shoulders. And at this point, I can look down the handle and say, yep, okay, everything's sort of lined up. I'm going to need to take down a little more of this side than that side when I do the rim. But there's no major twist that needs to be undone. So now I'm doing carving the, the tip of this rim here. And this is something that we cover in this issue of the Spoonosaurus magazine, is how important it is to keep the deepest part of your crank separate from the widest part of your bowl. So functionally that means that when you have your crank coming in like this, you don't want to have the deepest part be the widest part of the bowl. Because if you do, you'll get stuck on the rim going back and forth because the grain change happens right where you're going parallel because it's the widest part of the bowl. So by shoving this further this way, um, shoving the drawing further up so that the deepest part happens closer to the neck and then the widest part happens further up, you end up being able to carve the top rim all in one motion because right here where you get to the part where I'd have to start going uphill again, all I need to do is tilt my knife slightly and then all of a sudden I'm going downhill around the shoulder this way. So. Good. Okay. So now notice that I'm not trying to make this top face totally cleaned up either. Um, uh, all I'm trying to make sure of is that I have a clean spot here and here where I can uh, see that I don't have any cracks going down into the wood between here and the edge. Once I have that and I like the way the top rim profile looks, I'll then go to the back and I'll do the center of the back first. Because the center of the back defines the look that you see here because it's at the deepest part of the bowl. So, there we go, get the center of the back more or less the way I want it. Now I'll do the center of the handle. Now that I'm fairly certain about the depth I need in the handle, I can start removing some of this extra material. Um, and one thing I found is that I don't want to have... Uh, this keel line perfectly match what happens on the top, but I do want to remove a little more material and not just have it go be a straight line that goes from here to here, because you end up with more material than you really need. But that's more of a stylistic thing, honestly, um, than a functional thing. And you'll see that that cut is me actually pulling the spoon back so that my... Oh, it's actually below where you can see it. But I'm not pushing the knife. I'm... Uh, Simply holding the spoon back. Okay, so there we go. And now I'm going to do the sides of the bowl. The whole point of just doing this roughly is that every stage of carving a spoon is just about sort of bringing something that was rough and slowly and overall all over the form, bringing it slowly to a place of more and more refinement. But you don't want to bring one area completely to refinement while another area is lagging behind because the amount of 
force you exert on the wood diminishes as you get further and further refined and it, at first it's quite considerable and if you were to have a very refined section of the spoon and then you exerted that considerable force on a portion that was completely unrefined you would end up I've actually broken spoons that way, just snapped them in my hand from the force exerted by my hand. So, alright, so now I'm just very briefly cutting the back shoulders. Okay, so you can see within a couple minutes I have everything sort of untwisted. I've got the rough profile that I want, rough outline that I want. Now I'm going to put a sheath on my knife and redraw the shape. Any questions so far? As I uh, redraw the shape, I find it useful to draw the neck first because the neck is the pivot point between the weight of the bowl and the weight of the handle. So if there's going to be a mismatch between, you know, if, there's, if the bowl is going to look cocked that way versus the handle or vice versa, I can define the neck and then sort of see how to alleviate those, those inconsistencies. So you can see how the the handle goes this way and the bowl goes off that way just a little bit so I can make sure I adjust the bowl sometimes you adjust the bowl sometimes you adjust the handle sometimes you adjust both it really depends on which you know what options you have sometimes you because you have took one extra axe blow or whatever you sort of are backed more into a corner than you otherwise might be but if I can uh, I try to sort of adjust both. I'm sorry. If I can, I try to just adjust one of them and leave the other one alone because that's just what works for me. Fewest moving parts in that scenario. Okay, so now I've got my bowl shaped the way I want. What pencil do I use? Hi, Sean. Uh, Rachel Bainton asks, what pencil do I use? Um, this is just a Ticonderoga, Dixon Ticonderoga, HB2, number two pencil. Soft, it's what we used to do, crossword puzzles. So we got a lot of them around the house. I don't do anything fancy. Uh, with the pen that I use to draw the outline, Rachel, I use a, um, a Bic. I like these Bic crystal, and I use the medium the medium weight one rather than the standard or maybe they're called extra bold basically it's the one with, the, with where more ink comes out and I find it writes better on wet wood it doesn't do that thing where it stops writing so quickly so now I can get a clear sense of where in my handle I need to remove material in order to sweeten things up and the reason the pencil is so important for me is that I would never be able to sort of hold that moving target in my mind as I went along because as soon as I remove some material it would make it really difficult to see what needed to happen with the next thing so I find the pencil to be absolutely key for being able to swiftly get a sense of it so you can see all that extra weight of the handle is going to be removed here um, <laughs> Uh-huh. All right, so now, w when I was roughing out the spoon, I tend to do the bowl first, just to get it out of the way. Um, uh, when I do the, the second round, where I've done the pencil, I tend to do the handle first, because if you do the bowl first, you almost always bite in when you come down the handle. And if you do the bowl first and get this exactly where you want, then you're going to bite into it, and you're going to have to go back and remove some material that you didn't want to remove. So I do the handle first just leave it attached. It also creates this beautiful moment that I that I love where you have these long cuts still attached at the neck and it's just a lovely moment. Um, even if I wasn't looking for lovely moments to photograph it would still be a lovely moment that I'd want to just enjoy. Um, and again these cuts right so that and these cuts are um, again staying perpendicular uh, largely because Um, largely because by keeping things perpendicular, I, I have a much better sense of 
the overall look when you look at it in plan view and in profile view and then I'll do the chamfers last. If you start adding chamfers on at this stage it really confuses your sense of what you need to do to make everything symmetrical. So keeping everything square like that is an important part of my process. Things are always on an X plane or a Y plane. Okay, good. So now, I'm just gonna trim the top of the handle. I used to do really fancy finials on my hand on my spoons. This was actually before I was on Instagram. I would do balls and diamonds and things, and and then I started feeling like it was. I I got to the point where I was like getting like writer's block about carving because I didn't know what kind of finial I was going to do that was going to be new and different and better than the one before and I realized that it was keeping me from carving so I decided to go cold turkey on finials and not do any at all and since then I've come up just with this simple curve which I really like because I think that good design is a combination of curves and corners if it's all curves it looks blobby if it's all corners it looks spiky but things, I think, just as humans, we're drawn to things that have a, like a, a mix, a combination of curves and corners. So you can see right in here at the neck, I'm using just the tip. And I'm just very carefully easing under that. And if you do this carefully, you can get your finishing cuts right now at this stage. So one of the reasons that I'm able to carve spoons quickly is because... I carve wood that has just the right moisture content and that moisture content allows me I don't have to do uh, sort of rough out a spoon wait for it to dry and then carve it once it's dried out all over again I find that very stressful and instead I get to essentially create finished surfaces even midway through the process simply by the fact that the wood is dry enough that it's um, that it will behave itself and give me a nice clean smooth cut that will stay that way even this early on in the process so that for me gives me tremendous efficiency in that I don't have to go back and revisit every surface and then make mistakes and deal with the mistakes etc etc I just so it's and it also means that as I go through the process I think myself okay what can I do to uh, get to that point of creating a finished surface sooner. Can I make this cut that I'm making now, can that be the finished cut if I do it really well, right? And then if I'm aware that I'm trying to do a finished cut, I'll like be extra careful and then walk away from it and be done. So here I am, I'm making the finishing cuts in the neck. Here we go, nice and smooth. What is the moisture content? Uh, the, the, well, the truthful answer is I don't know. Um, the maybe more helpful answer is it comes from wood that's been sitting in the log for at least three or four months. And, um, and what that does is it still has some moisture in it. It's fairly, fairly moist, right? Like I can see a color change between it and the stuff that's dried out at the end grain that gets checked. And it behaves very beautifully, very elastic and smooth. Um, but it also is drying out very swiftly as I'm carving it. Like I can, if I were to leave this just sitting around for 10 minutes as I went to go make a cup of coffee, I would come back and I would notice that change. Um, all right, so now, Good. Now I'm just gonna clean up the lines. One of the reasons I like sort of smooth tapers, it doesn't have to be a perfectly straight line. In fact, that's really hard. Um, but one of the reasons I like smooth tapers is that it's just really easy to see if you've got them good or not. Uh, right? As soon as you put a lot of curve in something, it becomes much harder for your eye to uh, see if something is symmetrical or not. I also just like the simplicity of the aesthetic, but all right so the wood i carve has been sitting in the log for at least a couple months often it's longer than that this is a tree that came down in maybe august or september and then dano o'connor and i harvested it in october 
Um, all right, so now that I've carved my outline again, carefully this time, now I'm going to redo the top rim to make it sort of exactly what I want. I'm going to treat this surface as a top surface, but I'm going to do chamfer, so I'm not going to bother recarving the surface just to get rid of the pencil lines because the chamfers will eliminate that. So that's another example of the efficiency. So all I'm going to do is this top rim. One of the reasons I like this pro grind sloyd that Matt makes is that it's longer than his other knives, and it's certainly longer than a Moro 106. It's longer than most knives out there. And that extra length gives me, here, I'll show you side by side with the Moro 106. Right, so it's uh, got a, I don't know, quarter inch on it, and it might not look like much, but functionally, it just lets me get particularly on big spoons, doing these, these rim cuts on big spoons, that extra little bit of length, I am using every scrap of it to make my larger forms. Um, so that's one thing that I really like about it. Uh, I was curious, I, I asked Matt to make this knife longer because I was curious uh, about that video of Ian Constantine, the, the gypsy carver and how long of a knife he has. Actually, for that matter, that Swedish video of the guy with the handlebar mustache, if anyone knows what I'm talking about, he's got an enormous knife also. So um, I think it's not uncommon, or was not uncommon for spoon carvers to use much bigger knives than we think of today. All right, now I'm making a little defining the shoulder here a little bit better. I like my eating spoons to have a little bit of a sort of swan dive at the end down into the bowl. All right, so now I've got that top rim the way I like it. Nice sweet curve on the side, not too much curve, relatively flat, but just a little bit of curve. That way it slips out of your mouth easily. Now I'm going to redefine the bottom and I'm also going to pull up the uh, edges. In fact, I'm going to do the edges first because it's easier to get that edge exactly the way you want it and then work backwards from there. That way you won't screw it up. Um, I'm not taking my edge all the way down to finish, but I am about... Uh, you're making me a longer one, Matt? Yes! I, th I really think there's potential there. Um, so I'm taking my rim down to about half the width that it was in the prior stage. Again, not finished width by any means but um it's just a, a nice rule of thumb is, is reduce it by half <laughs> and by getting this rim thickness down now it means that you can sort of work up to it in either direction but you aren't going to try and change this rim thickness and therefore you aren't going to eliminate that rim thickness before you get further along if you were to eliminate it now it might be that you need to adjust that rim, and if you made it as thin as you wanted at the end, then you, you remove your ability to make that change without changing the way it looks from this way. <laughs> Seven-inch knife. Um, so, here I am. I think it's easy for spoons to have too much weight back here in the shoulder, so I always pay a lot of attention to make sure I'm reducing that. If you think about it, spoon doesn't need a lot of material there, and it's also one of the more awkward places to remove materials. So that's why I think it they tend to just sort of it tends to stay there, not because you need it, but simply because it's hard to make it go away. So now I'm going to do that same uh, center facet, and look at how long that center facet was. I went all the way from there to there in one cut, and that's a big part of making. Uh, the spoon feels smooth even with a knife finish is making long but controlled cuts so um, you can see I'm riding that cut along I'm not trying to make even facets that are going to stick around but I'm riding that knife along by starting as far back this way as I can and then extending that way and by extending my thumb and pulling back with my hand as far as I can, um, it allows me to get these long facets that really make a big difference. 
So, all right. So it's also easy to make spoons too deep because it's hard to visualize when your keel is a certain depth. It's hard to visualize how far to push into here. How long have I been carving, Emmett? Uh, let's see, five years now. Started when my six-year-old was about a year old. I'd been doing little things before that, but um, in terms of actually studying to get better at this and learning about it, uh, yeah, five years. And then functionally, like like trying to make a business out of it, three years, I would say. Okay, so now, whoops. Now I've got it basically the way I like it. Uh, I will probably adjust this a little bit more. Again, you really don't need much keel. And it's easy to leave that keel on there just out of inertia. Um, and then this also needs to be reduced back here. Good. When I was starting out carving, I would pretty routinely forget to make certain cuts. And so I'd go to use a spoon and I'd find that I hadn't chamfered the rim in this one spot because I just didn't have the habit of going all around and doing all the different things. And these days I tend not to forget things, but there are times when you're carving and you realize you like just didn't do this cut that you usually do where you were about to walk away from something without doing this thing that you habitually do. So, um, okay, so now I've got the outline the way I like it. I've got the profile the way I like it. I've got the rim thickness at the appropriate thickness at this point. So now I'm going to start doing the chamfer is down the back of the handle. Now again, this is my finished surface that's going to remain in the middle. But because of the style of handles I do that have sort of loose chamfers all the way down, I'm now going to knock off these corners. But I'm going to do it in a systematic way. So I'm going to do one on one side, come back and do the matching one on the other side. That way I can adjust them before I proceed, make sure that they're roughly even. You can see that I'm bracing the knife against my chest and pulling out, and that way I can actually see what I'm doing, right? So you can see that's about even at this point. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to knock off this corner and this corner of the chamfer, and that's going to make this sort of loose oval cross section to the handle without me having to get too fussy about the details of going into it. Um, okay. Uh, again, a lot of these choices have more to do with me being an impatient person and wanting a design that will carve quickly and reliably rather than it being something that, you know, you need to do with your spoon carving. It's just personal preference. Um, okay, so now I've rounded over the back of this. At what point in the process do I generally hollow out the bowl? Right at the end. You'll see. I'm getting there. All right, now when I look at this, this uh, this handle is still a little too thick for my taste. So, rather than wing it, though I know, I know you guys love to wing it, I'm going to actually draw this in with a pencil and see that if I take off just that little bit from that side, that's going to get the delicacy that I want at the handle there. So at this point, I don't wing it because I've got a lot riding on it. As I get further along in the process, I want to get more and more precise and eliminate risk, not invite risk. Um, okay, good. I just want to make that side. So the reason I do the bowl last is that 
if I do the bull last, I am keeping my options open in case something goes wrong. In case I discover a crack on the side and I all of a sudden need to make a baby spoon instead. Um, any books, recommendations on spoons? Barnes book is also great. Um, I would say my favorite right now is uh, The Art of Whittling by Niklas Carlson. I just really like his uh, whole ethos around carving and sort of talking about the different things you can make and his the culture that he portrays. He's from Sweden. He's uh, Sammy. And and it's just and he's also just a really cool guy. And uh, but yeah, I I found his book the most uh, inspiring for me. And then, um, but if you're a total beginner, I have to say I would recommend E. J. Osborne Hatchet and Bears book, uh, the Hatchet and Bear Guide to Spoon Carving. I think. Um, it's, it, I really love how EJ's approach is that like the wonkiness is to be embraced. And I think that that's a really valuable thing for all of us, but especially as a beginner, it's very empowering to hear that. And that would be the book that I'd recommend if you're just starting out. Um, all right, now I'm just cleaning up some bumps on the rim, but not going too crazy. There we go. What would you say, Rachel? Drawing is the bit you're worst at. How long to your journey do you think it took before you were confident at seeing and drawing symmetrical bowls and handles? Oh. Well, the first year, I only carved spatulas. So, and I, I didn't really think about the process all that much. I will say I'm much better at it now than I was at it. Even a little bit ago, you can see I'm just cleaning up some grain here that needed to be cut in the other direction. Um, so I'm much more confident at it now, and I get better results now in drawing symmetry than I was early on. Early on, I was also using a template, which I feel like helped teach me how to think in terms of spoon design, of replicable designs, but and probably helped me in other ways as well. But uh, honestly. I think it's much more valuable to try and train yourself to draw the same shape over and over again rather than use a template. Um, I think you can achieve the same results and more if you freehand draw than if you use a template. I used to say a template was a, a valuable step in the process, but I no longer think it is. I think you could just freehand draw and it would be more uncomfortable for a little bit, but you get there sooner. You get to that place of being confident in what you're you know, the shape you're making, and it would allow the shape to change and develop in ways that it otherwise won't. Um, okay, so now you can see how I've left this little bit here. Sorry, you missed the book title. It's called, um, oh yeah, this, so there's Spoon Carving by E.J. Osborne, and then uh, my personal favorite, just for inspiration, is The Art of Whittling by Niklas Carlson. Niklas, N-I-K-L-A-S. So now I'm just sweetening up this rim, now I get right to it and I can see how it looks. I'm sweetening up because I need to create this transition where it comes right up the, the neck here. Um, so I'm just going to recarve very gently this little bit here. These two cuts that do the rim cuts are pivot cuts, which means they sort of look awkward, but in theory, once you master the hand positioning, they can happen with very little force and very little effort. So now I, I have my symmetrical bevels here and here on the top. Um, and I'm going to do my little knockoff bevel. Right down here, It's I'm getting a little bit of grain tear out, so I'm not pushing it. And instead, I'm going to come back in the other direction and carve it in the other direction. Just like that, just real easy, real gentle. There we go. And this is where having sort of uh, facets that don't have to be perfect really is helpful because if I needed to have perfect facets, I'd be chasing this sucker all day long because this grain is 
tearing out a little bit here, a little bit there. But because I'm just going for a sort of average faceted look, uh, I'm, I'm basically done. Now I just need to knock off a little micro chamfer at the side. And that makes that corner not so sharp. Again on this side. So ultimately I want my spoon to feel faceted but smooth and soft in the hand. So these little micro chamfers are very important for that to happen. Um, and now, so now, can you buy this one? Sorry, uh, uh, this one is going to that Finnish company, uh, the lady who sources product for companies. This is this woman who reached out and asked if I could by any means make her a thousand spoons. Um, and I said I couldn't make her a thousand spoons, but if she ever needed 50 to 100 or something like that, I'd, I'd be happy to make them for her. And uh, she said, great, she'd love to work with me in the future. And can, uh, can I make her an example? So that's what this is. This is a high stakes spoon here. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Uh, Saloon Mood by William Yogi Sundquist, also great. Yup, yup, that's a classic. And that just got reprinted. When I started carving years ago, it, it, um, it hadn't been reprinted, and the only copies you could find were like hundreds of dollars on Amazon. Um, so that's really nice that that's now available. All right, just got to do a little, little bit of tear out here. Very good. Bit of a sharp line here, like that. Good, good. Okay, so now for the the top, what I found is that if I do, I used to do all my cuts this way, and uh, I found that I liked it much better if I did them sort of around, that I get these gentle sort of bump, bump, bump that I find really beautiful, and then uh, I just do. Get kind of a rounded pommel I then just sort of keep knocking off edges but instead of doing the thing where you sort of keep sort of chipping little things I'm doing long gradual cuts and that allows me to get a pommel that's both rounded this way and rounded that way really nicely um, I don't do any sanding process no I don't do any sanding process um, uh, so I will burnish at the end. You'll see that if I don't run out of time. I think I'm doing okay for time. Eaters don't take very long. Um, but I burnish uh, with a porcelain burnisher and then a broom corn polisher, both of which are tools that I designed that I collaborate with other makers and they make them for me. And I sell them. So if that's something you're interested in, you can let me know. Uh, good news, everybody who has ordered a porcelain burnisher. I've been in touch with the guy. He's sending out the next order. He's going to work on the next order real soon. So porcelain burnishers start, should start moving along much quicker than they have been. You all have been very patient, um, and I appreciate it. And things look like they're going to start picking up on the porcelain burnisher front, which is great because there's a lot of people who want them. So, all right, at this point, you could fuss with this forever, and you need to just be done at some point. So now, at this stage where I've got the handle basically all done, uh, and I have left the bowl, because again, that gives me options. If I had discovered a fatal crack over here on the side, I could still get a smaller spoon out of it as long as I hadn't carved the bowl. But as soon as you carve the bowl, you're committing. So I'm waiting to commit until the last possible minute so that if I need to pivot, I can pivot. So now I'm going to carve the bowl. I have left the back rougher than it's going to be because... Um, uh, just because. So, move this a little bit so you guys can see the bowl carving process a little bit better. So I always pinch it here and hold everything in here, or I pivot it and hold everything in here. So it's kind of difficult for you guys to see. Basically what I'm doing is, so you can see how much I'm choked up on this knife here. And uh, that way it won't hit my hand, and I also have as much power as I could. If I was backed off here, the chance of me hitting my thumb is much higher, and I have way less power. Um, and if I'm back here, I have very little power, and uh, well, I'm not in danger of hitting my hand, but very little power, I feel like. So I always work super choked up on the knife. 
and everything happens being pressed into my palm. And in general, I start in the middle of the bowl and establish the hollow, first from one side and then from the other side. And only once I've established a hollow do I start creeping out towards the rim. Whew, it's hot in this greenhouse. Could be in a t-shirt instead of a long sleeve shirt and a sweater. That's the nice thing about this space. I don't often work out here for carving just because it's nice to be in the house, but this is awfully nice in here. Um, okay. So I've left the outside of the bowl rough because what I found is that it works better to do the inside or rather it's more efficient to do the inside to what feels exactly right on your mouth and then match the outside to that rather than try and guess at what would work on the outside and then get the inside to match it and then either you're right or you're wrong. I'm a big believer in just doing something until it feels exactly right. So, okay, I'm getting this rim fairly close to being way I want it. And now I'm going to pick up the Sloyd knife again and do one more go at the rim. And the reason for that is that this rim is tilted out. And when I get to this stage where the rim is quite narrow, um, I'm going to take the Sloyd knife and just recarve the rim so that instead it doesn't tilt out quite so much. And that will help all the lines flow together. And it's one last chance for me make sure that that curve is exactly the way I want it. So you can see now, and make sure that that line goes up to there. Good. So you can see how that is different than that. That's the one that got recut. It's much more in a plane with this. And then here it's much more tilted out tried your hand position with the hook today choked up etc whoa your hand hurts it does yeah it uses very very different muscles rachel it um yeah it, it's like totally different muscles but once you get used to it i do think you'll find it everything like the 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 hollowing just takes less time um so it really speeds up the process but you're right it is it is a specific set of muscles that you would otherwise not have um, and that's something that I've had to build up to. Um, I'm curious how much I would feel if I did yours. I'm guessing I would, similar to lead to you, uh, my hand would be hurting from using muscles that I otherwise normally don't use. So, good. So I like it. Now you can see that rim is nice and even. Um, I don't have a carving room in my house, Jake, that's like specifically for carving. Um, I tend to carve in my kitchen. Um, and then I just sweep up after me. So now I can see some irregularities in this outline. And right now I'm going to attend to it. Uh, this amount of irregularity, I might leave if it were a, a normal order, but because it's this order that sort of has a lot riding on it. I'm going to take the extra minute to get it kind of as nice as I possibly can. Okay. Good. I tend not to cut rims like this with this sort of potato peeler cut, except in this instance where I'm doing just very tiny adjustments and I need to be able to see exactly what I'm doing. And then I'll do it in this way. Otherwise, when I've tried to do it with larger, more powerful cuts, I found that I, I uh, end up with not as smooth a curve as if I just eyeball it and, and do it by, by feel. Um, like anything, I imagine I would get better at it, but 
so far I just haven't wanted to do that. So, a little bit more here. Okay, you can see that that shape is much sweeter now. Um, okay, good. So now back to the hook. Do the final work in the bowl. And now what I want to do is I want to uh, I want to essentially go out and create that inner rim exactly the way that the, the thickness that I want it and and then stay away from it while I create the curvature on the inside that I want. Now I used to do my rims the same thickness all the way around but gradually I realized that rims actually a, a truly like really functional rim doesn't need to be the same thickness all the way around. It needs to be thickest at the tip because that's where it gets all of the contact and then can be thinner here on the sides and then maybe a little bit thicker towards the back but not as thick as it is at the tip. So that's what I shoot for now. Um, and I think that that variable thickness rim is something that happens in all of my spoons, not just eaters, um, for kind of the same reasons. Um, there are also certain types of cooking spoons where having a thin rim is advantageous, like salad servers, for instance. It's helpful if they have thin rims because it helps the salad server slide between the salad and the bowl without crushing the delicate bits of lettuce. Um, so now I'm really carefully looking at that line that I'm cutting. And this is where you can get light. It's not a great. Here we go. That's better for me. Um, if you can get light over directly onto your spoon, it will really help you see what needs to happen. Okay. So. Okay, so you can see, oh, I don't know if you can see, there we go, how thin it is there, and it's about twice as thick up there, and then somewhere in between down here. Do I ever worry that I'm losing natural flow by over-engineering the balance and aesthetics? Uh, I don't, Graham, uh, but I think I see, I think about natural flow maybe a little differently than other spoon carvers. I think of natural flow as being something that happens from uh, worrying about the balance and aesthetics. Um, hey, <laughs> thanks. I think those salad, uh, salad servers are going to work well. We haven't tested them yet, but, uh, I'm, I think they're going to be a, a big improvement. Um, so Graham, it's a great question. Uh, I think a lot of carvers like to sort of go with the flow and let the wood dictate. I think for me, a pleasing object is one that has a certain form and the wood is just it doesn't have a pleasing form because the wood naturally took that form. It has a pleasing form because I understood what a pleasing form would be and I had the skill to create that within the wood. Um, that to me is what I find pleasing. So it's definitely a personal thing, but for me, the, the skill is in understanding the really subtle aesthetic choices and being skilled enough to manipulate them exactly how I want them. So, like, for instance, if you go to, um, I don't know, like a hashtag, like, minimal design on, on Instagram, and you look at some of that, some of the, like, minimally designed stuff, I find a lot of the proportions of that stuff to be very, uh, to be just a little bit off. It doesn't please me. And then occasionally you'll see one where you're like, God, that's exactly right. It's exactly spot on. And to my mind... It could be the person just got lucky, but I think that there's a certain education that happens when you think deeply about these things, where you actually start knowing exactly what you want and being able to achieve that, either whether that's drawing it like an artist or, uh, or a designer or creating it in wood like us. Um, but I feel like the more you can articulate what you want, the more the more likely you are to develop the skill that will allow you to then create it. 
So that's, I'm always a big one for articulating 